so glad that you're here this morning. Um, as you kind of come and start settling in, um, I'm just going to say a quick prayer um, over our worship this morning. So you join me as I pray. Um, God, we just thank you for who you are. God, we just come into this place expecting and knowing that you are going to do amazing things. So God, as we come, I pray that our hearts just be ready, that our minds be ready just to see who you really are. God, as we sing these songs, I pray that they're not just words, but they are expressions of our heart. God, that they're declarations of our faith to you this morning. So God, we love you. We thank you. We give you all our praise in your name. Amen. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless with awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphans son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Come on. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered. Find someone next to you and just welcome them that here this morning.
so we're gonna we're gonna continue worshiping this morning as you finish up. We sang this song a couple weeks ago. Um, it's just declaring the fact that there's nothing that God can't do. Um, so we're gonna sing that together. Just one word. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Just one. Just one touch. I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. In just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one, just one word. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. And just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall He can break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh.
come. Yeah, can we praise him this morning? God, we praise you. God, we declare the fact, God, that, that at your name, God, mountains move. At your name, all things are good. So, God, we declare who you are this morning. God, fill this place and let us feel you, God. Let us hear you. God, break down those walls. So as we declare your name, we feel you touching us this morning. God, we love you. We declare your praise. We declare your beautiful name this morning. We love you. We thank you. We give you this. Your name.
Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name Just her voice is what a beautiful What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. God, we declare your beautiful name this morning. God, we feel you. God, we see you. God, we declare this to you this morning. God, we love you. God, may we feel you. May we see you. May our eyes be open, God. God, may Cody's words not be his own, but may they be completely from you. And may our ears be open and ready to hear it, God, and to implement it, God. We thank you. We love you. We give you this. And all God's people said... Amen. He is good. Amen. Can we praise him this morning? So you may be seated. Um, we're entering another time where we want to keep worshiping. Um, and we're going to do this through tithe and offering. It's our way of saying, God, in all things I trust you. I know these last um, few weeks we've been talking about what it means to give everything. Time, talent, treasure. Um, so in this way, it's us saying, you know what, God, I trust you with everything because it's yours anyways. Um, so so as, we, as we do this this morning, I just want to say, um, I want to say a prayer over over the um, offering at this time. Will you, will you please pray with me? God, we're just in awe of how good you are. God, and as, as we give, we remember that. And we give faithfully because of that. That God, you are so good and you are so worthy. God, we don't wanna just give you the core of our apple. We wanna give you all the pieces. So God, we, we come and, and we accept the challenge, God, to give faithfully. God, because it's yours, and we see the blessings that flow through it. God, not just in this place, but God, in our own lives. God, so we love you, we thank you, we give you this in your name. Amen. If uh, the ushers could please come down at this time. Perfect. And while, um, while, they, while they go forward um, and receive the offering, um, you can check out these announcement videos. It is coming. Hi everyone, welcome to Selma First Baptist. My name is Isaiah Escobedo. I am the junior high director here at the church. Hey, we're so glad to have you. Hey, if you are new, uh, and if you'd like to get more information about our church, we have a little connect card in the back at our information station. If you want to grab that, fill out your information and pass it back in, um, this is just a way, great way for us to get to know you and also pass on more information about what's going on here at Selma First Baptist. Speaking of things going on here at Selma First Baptist, we have two announcements. The first announcement that we have is our hymn sing. Uh, our hymn sing will be cut this coming Saturday. It will be downstairs in the fellowship hall at 1.30 p.m. Uh, make sure if you're coming to bring a green dessert and to also wear green uh, they're, as they're also going to be celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Also coming up on March 11th, we have our family night. It will be at 6 p.m. Hey, come out. This is a great way for us just to gather and fellowship together as a family uh, here at Selma First Baptist and to also just enjoy a lovely meal. So make sure to come out at 6 o'clock. Uh, here at the church down in the fellowship hall. Hey, we're so thankful to have you guys here at Summer First Baptist. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Amen. Welcome to Summer First Baptist. How are we doing this morning, guys? There we go. There we go. I am excited to be here. I am Cody. I'm the director of youth ministries here at Summer First Baptist. If you did not know that, hey, that's me. I am. There you go. Thank you, Tarn. Thank you. He's my biggest fan. Uh, I am so glad you guys are here. And I want to start with kind of a, not, not, disclaimer is not the right word. I want, to, I want to start by addressing something with you guys. I believe each and every one of you is here for a reason today. I believe that. I believe that with everything I got. I believe that. And I've been praying for you guys since I knew that I was going to be speaking today. So about a month and a half ago. I've been praying for each and every one of you guys. I've spent time praying over these chairs. Praying over that doorway. Praying for you guys. I want you to know that. 
I, I, I need you guys to know that. And I know that right now it's a little bit weird, right? Things are kind of different, right? We're in this building. It's weird, right? It's dark, right? So that's different, right? There's a lot of different things going on. Um, as a church, we've experienced some change, right? As, as a, about a week and a half ago, uh, Mary Nell and Bryant stepped down in their roles, and, uh, and God has directed them somewhere else, and that's okay. We're excited for them and where God is leaving, leading them. We're praying for them. We are pumped for them. But I'm also pumped for us as a church and where God is leading and directing us to go. And I believe that if we begin to tap into that, some, something pretty crazy is going to happen. You guys believe that today? Yeah. Amen? I feel like, <laughs> that's exciting. All right, so let's, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are, God. Thank you for what you've done for us, God. Thank you for where you are leading us to and where you have led us from, God, and where, you, where you're bringing us. I thank you that your presence is here today, Lord. It is palpable. I can feel it, God, and that is exciting. God, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray this message would not be my words. Lord, I pray that you would take me out of the equation. It would all be you. I pray for our ears, for our hearts, and for our minds, Lord, that we would hear your words today, God, and that we would want to move in your direction. In your name I pray, amen. So I wanted to ask this question, just a show of hands. Who here has ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Okay, okay. I, that's a lot more than I expected, right? You guys haven't. That's okay. You guys should. Uh, Groundhog Day is a fantastic movie, right? I love Groundhog Day. I didn't really watch it until last year, and then I watched it. I was like, this is a great film. Uh, it's Bill Murray, who's a weatherman, and he's kind of full of himself, right? And Bill Murray uh, is told to go to the little, uh, it's not a rural town of Pennsylvania. I'm not even going to try to say what it is. Anyone want to correct me on what it's called? The, the town? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I'm not even going to try it, right? And so it's where the Groundhog Day celebration is, right? You know, where they lift up the groundhog, and if he sees his shadow, it's six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't, it's six more weeks of sp or early spring, whatever it is, right? And so Bill Murray's character doesn't want to be there. He's too, big, he's too much of a big shot. He doesn't want to be there, but he's forced to be there. So he shows up, and he's kind of angry about it like the first day, right? And he gets through his day, does all the stuff he needs to do, and then he wakes up the next morning, and he realizes he's still in that little bed and breakfast in, you know, whatever, rural town. Of Thank you, Ben. We're just going to keep, keep this going back and forth. Thank you. Uh, and so he's in this little rural town, right? And it's like, okay, cool. That's, that's where he is. He wakes up again. He's like, this is weird. The radio is the same, same kind of radio station it was the day before, and they're saying the same thing. He thinks like, man, this small town really doesn't have anything going on. They're saying the same stuff they did yesterday looks outside and he realizes it's the same day all over again. What the heck? And if you guys have seen the movie, or even if you don't, you guys have heard the reference Groundhog Day, he begins to do the same thing over and over and over again. He gets stuck in this time loop, this cycle of doing the same day over and over and over again. I won't ruin the movie for you guys. Go watch it. And if you haven't seen it in a while, watch it again, right? But the idea I want to bring out from that is how easy it is for us to get stuck in a cycle or get stuck in a rut, right? Like, if we think about ruts that we get stuck in, some of us get stuck in ruts of depression, right? Ruts of anxiety, right? We get stuck in this cycle where we're continuing to just be in that system, right? Some of us, we get stuck in, in ruts of, of pride, right? Where it's got to be all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. I got to get the next title. I got to look this way. I got to dress this way. I got to do whatever it is, right? It's all about our pride. For some of us, it's ruts of addiction, whether that be alcoholism, or maybe it's uh, using of pills, or maybe it's pornography, I know, guys, it's Sunday morning, I said pornography. Buckle in, it's going to be a wild ride this morning, all right? Um, but listen, the fact of the matter is, is we get stuck in these ruts. And I would argue that us as a church, not necessarily some of First Baptists, although we do fall into us, but us as individuals, as a church collectively, right, we fall into ruts of religion. Where it's not really about Jesus, it's more about going to church and going through the motions. You guys following me? And I feel like I fall in this rut a little bit. Uh, listen, again, Pastor Jack asked me to speak about a month and a half ago. I said, hey, Cody, I'm going to be out of town that day. Would you be willing to speak? And I said, yeah, absolutely. If you know me, anytime I get to be on stage, I'm excited, right? Like, I just love being on stage. And so um, he goes, absolutely, Pastor Jack, I'll do it. And he said, okay, cool. Um, I go, what do you want me to speak on? He goes, well, we'll just have finished up our T3 series, right? Time, Talent, and Treasures. Okay, cool. What, what series are we in? He's like, we're not in a series. Whatever God's speaking to you, go ahead and we'll talk about it. And that, that might be what you need to speak on. And immediately I knew what it was because it was something that God has been working on me. God's been working with this in my life, probably since November. And God's been working me through some stuff. 
And so I'm like, this is what I want to speak on. It's talking to me. It's talking to the church. I feel like it's applicable. And he says, amen. And then now with all the recent changes, it's, it's even more applicable because God is still moving. God is still doing something. I fully believe that, church. I don't just say that when I come up on the, at the end of, of Pastor Jack's sermons. I don't just say that to say that. Right? I say that because I believe it. And I, can, I know what's happening. Um, we've been talking about time, talent, and treasures. And what that is is that is uh, God demands our time, our talent, and our treasures right, uh, as obedience to him. Right? We, we went through that three-week series. If you didn't see it, uh, please go online. It's online on YouTube and stuff. right? And go look those things up. Okay? It's a really great series that we went through. And we talked about how that is obedience. And I wanted to, to beg the question to you guys today to start off. Why do we need to be obedient to God? Right, why? I mean, like, we all know we need to be obedient to God, right? Yeah, be obedient to God. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. But why? The reason being is God is our creator, right? We look at Genesis. We see Adam and Eve, right? They're in the Garden of Eden. It's this perfect shalom, this perfect peacefulness, right? This is God and his creation thriving, right? And then the enemy enters the picture, and, and they eat of the tree they weren't supposed to, right? And sin enters the world. And when sin enters the world, Adam and Eve are then kicked out of the garden because there's no longer perfect shalom with God because sin has entered the picture. And so there's this kind of this brokenness, this disconnect between us and God. And there, there was a sacrifice required now to be indwelling with God, right? I like to think of this as, as like, I use this example all the time in high school, and it's, it's this example of, if you, ha if you guys ever been to the Grand Canyon, I have a nod hands, no, not all of you guys have, that's okay. If you've been to the Grand Canyon, thank you, Tiffany, if you've been to the Grand Canyon, it looks fake, because it's so massive. It's one of the most beautiful things America has to offer. It's massive. It's huge. And so if you imagine, it, you've seen pictures of it, I'm sure, right? So you imagine everyone you ever know or ever have heard of lines up on one side of the Grand Canyon, okay? You can stand next to whoever you want. Okay, for me, I'm going to be standing next to Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, Francis Chan on this side. And on this side, I'm going to have LeBron James, uh, David Ortiz, Von Miller on this side, right? And this kind of, these are athletes and, and preachers and stuff, okay? So we're all lined up on this line, right? We're all lined up on this line. And God is on the opposite side. He's on the other side of the Grand Canyon. And we're told, all right, you have to jump to reach God. I don't know about you guys. But none of us are going to make it there, right? These guys, they're not going to get very far, right? Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, well, now they really won't get any far. Sorry, I shouldn't have made the joke. I'm sorry, guys. I told myself I wasn't going to do it. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me, right? Okay, but they're not going to get very far, right? And you look on this side, like LeBron's going to be able to jump pretty good, right? Uh, you know, some of these athletes, right? Von Miller's going to be able to jump pretty good, right? These guys are going to be able to jump pretty far, but they're not going to be able to make it to the other side. And then me, I'm not even going to make it as far as Mother Teresa, right? I mean... I am frightfully Caucasian. My jumps are not there, and so I'm going to be kind of like, eh, right? Like, not very far, right? But the fact of the matter is, is no matter how much we jump, we're all going to be plummeting to our death. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday service. How are we doing? Right? We're going to plummet to our death. We cannot make it to God on our own power. And we as creation have an innate need, an innate desire to be with our creator. I had this old pickup truck that had been totaled like a thousand times, right? And I had totaled it at one point when I was in high school. And so my grandpa, myself, and my dad kind of worked on it over the course of a year because I was a flake and, you know, whatever. We finally got the thing running again. The battery was zip-tied in. The air filter was duct-taped to the side, right? It was just this really janky truck. It felt like the Indiana Jones ride. The passenger seatbelt didn't work, which was great. If I was going on a date with Kelsey, I'd be like, hey, you got to sit in the middle. The safety first, right? You know what I mean? It was great. But then when, like, Isaiah would get all sweaty and next to me, I'd be like, dude, stop. Get, dude, sit over there. He's like, I have to be safe. I'm like, Isaiah, come on, man, right? <laughs> You get on that side. Just sit in the bed of the truck. It's fine. But the fact of the matter is, is that when I drove that truck around, sometimes I'd get in the car and I'd turn the key and it wouldn't start. But because I helped rebuild this thing, I knew what was wrong with it. I was like, oh, the zip tie to the battery broke. We just got to re-zip tie that in and reconnect it. We're good to go. <laughs> right? I'd be on a date and I'd be like, oh, this happens all the time. Give me a sec. I'd pop the hood. Right? Okay, cool. We got to re-duct tape this in there, right? A little toolbox where I had all my little tools. Or maybe it made a whining sound. We got to tighten up the belt real quick. Uh, the, the window, okay? One time Terry borrowed it, and the window, they couldn't get the window up. Because the window, you had to roll it up, right? It was one of those guys. But you had to also grab the window itself and kind of slide it up and kind of, right? It was just really just not a good process. It was a really janky truck. But, but I love that thing, and I knew how to work it because I was the one that fixed it. God has created us, and we function best when we're with our creator. So how do we get to our creator if we're, there's this giant chasm between us? And you all know the answer, right? What is the answer? 
Jesus. That was close, Sarah. That was good. That was good. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus, right? Jesus lived a perfect life. The Son of God lived a perfect life. And after doing this ministry, right, God says, okay, now it's time to sacrifice my son on a cross so that all mankind can be saved. They nailed Jesus to a cross, and he died. A death for you and for me. But he didn't just die. He didn't just end at the cross, right? It wasn't just another sacrifice. Because three, day late, three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death once and for all, for all of us. So that gap between us and God is now closed. There now we can dwell with our creator. We can have shalom with our creator again. Peace with our creator. We as creation need our creator. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39 says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is why we need to be obedient, is to be with God, to love him, to be in relationship with him. And we need to love him with all we got. What does it mean to love him with all we got? Romans 12 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let me, see, let me hear you say worship, church. Worship. worship. That's that key word right there. Worship. Because we talked about time, talent, and treasures being obedience, and on this end, it's worship. And I think that, that we can sometimes, and I do this occasionally, where we, we separate the two. We go, well, worship is the music we sing on Sunday morning, and we know that like giving tithe and giving of our time, those, those, are, yeah, those are called worship. But really, that's more like obedience, and they're in two separate pools. They're not. They are together. Offer your body's living sacrifices. These things are together. Worship and obedience go hand in hand, and they intertwine Worship is obedience. Oftentimes we separate the two because we feel like one is more of a feeling and one was more of a just kind of an action. But listen, a few months ago, um, I, I get mentored by uh, Peter Anderson. Some of you guys know him. Uh, he was my youth pastor, and, and I love Peter. And he, he, was, he and I were talking, and it was a few months ago, probably like October, November, and I said, Peter, man, I'm really not feeling God. You guys ever felt that way? You don't have to nod if you don't want to. That's okay. But I really wasn't feeling God. I'm not feeling it, man. It was really... Yeah, he goes, how often are you reading your Bible? Oh, man, it's been a couple, it's been like a week. Okay, it's been like a couple weeks. He's like, okay, okay, all right. You're not reading your Bible, cool. How often do you tithe? Ooh, man, I mean, money's tight. We got, we got stark, you know, we have, we have some costs we really got to pay. He's like, okay, 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 all right. How often are you actively engaging in worship on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights with the youth? How often are you actually engaging in that? I'm like, well... You know, sometimes I don't like the style of music, or I don't like if this happens, I don't like it. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's all about you, Cody. It's all about you, huh? He then leaned into me, and this is your first fill-in. Obedience is not a feeling. If you're taking notes, write that down. Obedience is not a feeling. Listen, if there's a mantra, that might even be my next tattoo. I don't know, right? Obedience is not a feeling. That's so important for us to realize Worshiping the, Lord, worshiping the Lord is our obedience, right? That's part of obedience. They go hand in hand, as I said. And so we, we cannot rely on our feelings because feelings are fleeting. Feelings are still important, right? We know that feelings are important. Our emotions have validity to them, but and we know this because Jesus wept, right? We know that Jesus wept because of the feelings of the people around him, right? So we know that our feelings are important, but we cannot rely exclusively on our feelings. We need to be obedient to God, even when it comes to worship. Uh, Pastor Paul Tripp of Westminster Theological Seminary says this. He said, human beings, by their very nature, are worshipers. Worship is not something we do. It defines who we are. You cannot divide human beings into those who worship and those who do not. Everybody worships. It's just a matter of what or whom we serve. We are all worshipers. And worshiping God and pursuing Jesus with everything we got, offering our bodies as living sacrifices, right? Doing these things is, is a relationship with Jesus. It's not a religion. Amen? Yeah. It's not about a religion. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus. That's why oftentimes if you talk to me, I'm going to say I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not really going to say I'm a Christian. Yeah, those two words kind of go hand in hand, right? They're, they're interchangeable. But for me, I feel like follower of Jesus has a little more power to it because it's more Jesus-centered. Right? Christianity, we kind of put into a religious box sometimes. And that's not what I want. 
I want people to know I'm a follower of Jesus. I think that's important. You don't have to take that, but you can take it or leave it. That's up to you. But see, the reason this is a relationship and not religion, because what religion lacks, your next point, what religion lacks is true worship. What religion lacks is true worship. If we look at religion, the word religion is defined as like worship, or is, is defined as uh, believing in a belief system in a higher power, right? That's kind of like the Webster's Dictionary or whatever of it. But I believe religion we also use is like a word that we use pretty often. Like, for example, the Rosenfelds back there, they work out religiously, right? Look at his arms. They're bigger than my head, okay? Like, the guy works out religiously, right? I obviously do not work out religiously, right? And that's not a bad thing that they work out religiously. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing, right? Some of us, we drink coffee religiously, right? I do. I've had like three cups this morning, right? And, and thanks, Taylor, by the way. Thanks for the coffee. Uh, that's why I'm all jacked up. No, that's not what it is. Uh, <laughs> he was like, that makes sense. Sally's like, Cody, slow down. I get it. But we do things religiously, right? We brush our teeth religiously. And again, not all these things are bad, but the idea of religion when it comes to, uh, when it comes to following Jesus is, is a good thing, right? It's good to read your Bible every day. It's good to go to church every Sunday. It's good to be engaged in worship. It's good to do these things if we're actually engaged and we're pursuing it because of our relationship with Jesus and not because Jesus is our safety blanket to get us out of hell. That's not the intent. Because if Jesus is just your safety blanket, you're missing the point right? You're missing the point. Jesus wants us to be real and active disciples of him, following him, right? Matthew 28, for all, or, wrong verse, my bad. I almost, almost went the opposite direction there, Isaiah. You caught me? You like that? Okay. But Matthew 28, right? It says, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? What religion lacks is true worship. Let me, let me give you guys this example. I'm going to need that chair right there. So can you move that stuff real quick, Isaiah? If I was to go to Kelsey and I was to say, hey, Kelsey, I'm going to live, our marriage now is going to be a religion, no longer a relationship. Like, we're not, going to, we're not going to do this anymore the way we do it now, where we love each other and have mutual respect and things like that. I'm going to treat this as a religion. I'm going to treat you like how I treat Jesus sometimes. And I said, I'm only going to talk to you once a week. But I'm not even going to talk to you. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come into you, Kelsey, and here's what's going to happen. On Sunday mornings, you and I are going to sit down for an hour, and I'm just going to sit there, and you can talk. Or maybe even you don't have to talk. Maybe one of your friends can talk for you, and I'm just going to sit here and listen. I'm not going to talk back. I'm not going to be actively engaged in this conversation. I'm just going to sit here. But I swear, Kelsey, if you go over an hour 15, I'm going to walk out the door. I got Sal's reservations. Okay, I'm going. Yeah, some of you guys are like, yeah, amen, hour 15. Keep it less than that, right? But that's how we get sometimes, where we just sit down and we don't actually get involved with Jesus and the movement he's doing in our church. We miss the point, right? If I was to do that with my wife, we would lose intimacy, both physically and emotionally. We would lose love. We would lose passion. We'd lose all these things if I was to treat her like a religion. Or if I only called her when I thought I was going to get hit by another car, I was like, oh, you know, because we're like, Jesus, take the wheel. If I was like, Kelsey... You know what I mean? This guy almost rear-ended me. Kelsey. Our marriage would be lacking. Severely lacking. Now, there are times where love is, is kind of hard. Right? There's times where it's hard for her to love me. Never the opposite way. It's always hard for her to love me. You guys know me. You know that's true. Um, and that's where the religious aspect comes in, where she's like, listen, he's my husband. I'm going to love him no matter what. Obedience is not a feeling. I don't like him right now, but I love him. Right, that's, we need to love Jesus with everything we've got. Everything we got. That is our, our true worship. Listen, church, we as a church are designed to love people. That is the original intent of the church, right? To love people, to be a community of believers that get together and reach the community around them. That is the design of the church. To go and make disciples, not to just sit down and have a country club mentality. And that's what I'm afraid the American church falls into a lot of times. All, uh, the global church falls into this too, but specifically the American church falls into this where we are just like, oh no, it's just about us, right? What are you wearing at church? Cody, you were speaking in another flannel? Really? Again? Right? Listen, I promise you right now, I'm going to make a promise to you. You'll never see me in a tie unless I'm making a funny video or something with Taylor, okay? You won't see me in a tie. Okay, I'll get out of it. If you're like, Cody, it's a black tie event, I'll be like, mm, no, I didn't wear a tie for my wedding. I'm not going to wear a tie to anything else, okay? Just so we're aware, okay? That's just how I am. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I love you, but that's the way I am. 
<laughs> had nothing to do with anything. I just want to be really against ties. <laughs> But we as a church are designed to be a hospital, not a country club. Listen, I think we shouldn't call this Sunday service anymore. I think we should call it a Sunday gathering. Here's why. Service, the word service, we, we take our car to get serviced, right? We got to go get it fixed up, an oil change, maybe a new tire rotation, whatever it is, right? Or maybe we go get our nails, we go get our nails done, right? We're getting our nails serviced, right? Yeah, yeah I do that all the time, obviously. But we do these things, that, that is, and the idea is that we're getting at service. When we call this a Sunday service, friends, I think the idea, even though that may not be our heart, but the idea that kind of gets thrown out there is like, oh, I'm here to get serviced, right? It's my, my weekly Christian obligation to come to church, sit down in these uncomfortable chairs, <laughs> and listen to a word of God, and hopefully it doesn't go over too long, right? That's what we do. That's not what church is about. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Can I get an Amen. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. He washes his disciples' disgusting and dirty feet, including Judas, including the one that would betray him. God loves the people we hate, friends. God loves all people. I think we as a church need to be activated to love the people around us in our community. Amen? Yeah. Amen. That's what we're designed as. Let me go to my next page of notes here. Moving forward. We need to get back to the heart of worship. Where it is all about God and not about us. Not about our self-interest. Not about what we like, what we dislike, what clothes we're wearing. Whether it's too bright, whether it's too dark. And listen, I fall into this too, okay? Because honestly, if it was up to me, it would be pitch black in here. We'd have lasers and smoke and it would be so loud that you couldn't even hear yourself sing, right? Because as Justin knows back there, and if you sit in the back, you hear me sing. And it's not a good noise, it's just a joyful noise, right? Like God doesn't say it has to be good. It's just got to be a joyful noise, right? And that's why I'm just going to sing at the top of my lungs because that's what I'm, God, I'm given it to you but it's not about me it's about him everything we do needs to be about him not about us and we need to be asking ourselves where do we fall into this religion when we're just going through the motions or we make it about ourselves where do we fall into this rut into this cycle of religion so we need to be asking ourselves and i think it's when we say what's the way it's always been done Ooh. or so and so did it this way so it's got to continue to be that way Hit a couple nerves. I know I hit myself too. Trust me. Listen, there are things that the Bible tells us we cannot change, right? Like we know this to be true, right? Like uh, there was a pastor, I was listening to a podcast this week, and the pastor was talking about, he's saying, listen, he goes, when I got hired on at this church, it was Harris Creek Church in, in Waco, he goes, listen, when I got hired on the church, I asked the board of directors, I said, or the board, you know, he said, he said, listen, I got a couple questions for you guys. What are some golden calves in your church? I said, well, I don't think we really have any. He goes, okay, good, good. I'm really glad, right? After some thought, they go, we don't think we really have any. He goes, that's good. He goes, so, hey, I'm going to change Sunday service. It's no longer going to be on Sundays. It's going to be on Thursdays. Is that okay with you? No, that's not okay. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I'm just, I'm just curious, okay? Um, hey, the worship, the music that we play on the Sunday morning? Yeah, I'm going to get rid of it. Is that cool with you guys? Well, no, it's not. I'm just going to come in and preach for an hour. Is that okay? They're like, no, that's not okay, right? Okay, good, 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 good. Hey, we're going to get rid of baptism, so we're not going to do that anymore. Is that fine? No, what he was wanting to point out to them, he goes, good. That is biblically okay to hold on to, right? Like, we believe that Christ died and rose again on a Sunday. That's why the Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday, right? We believe that to be true, so it's good that you want to meet on Sundays. That's good that Sunday is the new Sabbath. Amen. We know that baptism is a big, crucial part of Christianity, right? We just talked about it. Matthew 28, make disciples and baptize them, right? Okay, baptism is important. Okay, good. We know that worship is important because even at the beginning of the church, right, when the church first started, they would sing songs, right? We know that that is important. These things we cannot change, and we believe that. The way we do it might change. We might add another service. Maybe we have a night church service. We don't know, right? We might do that. Maybe the worship, we, we change the way we do worship a little bit, or maybe we change the way we do baptisms, right? We do them in a pool on the street corner. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys remember that a couple months ago? You remember that? These are exciting things that we do sometimes to change stuff up, but we know that the heart of those cannot change. But anything we do, I want to challenge you. Anything we do, ask the question, why? Why do we do it the way we do it? Why do we do it at all? Every event we've done, I've been here for a year now. Yeah, you guys have put up for me, with me for a year. Amen. You guys have made it. I have not died. None of us, are, we're good. Okay, we're good. But listen, 
Every time we do any event at youth group or any time I give a message at youth group, and even after today, I'm going to ask my leaders, Allie, do I not ask you guys this every week, how to go? What could be better? What could have changed? What went well? What, went, what didn't go well? How do we make this better for next week? Or how do we make this better for next year if we're doing a big event? Or do we even do this next year? If the event's terrible, do we hold on to it? I mean, we've done it for seven years, but does it mean that it's working? I mean, we only have like 10 kids coming out to this. Does it actually matter? Like, should we change it up? These are the questions that we ask because we're holding our methods loosely because we realize that, that sometimes things need to change in order to reach more people for Jesus. We need to ask, is this going to reach people in 2020? This reached people in 2007, right? For me, it was so difficult to come into youth ministry. I've done youth ministry now for seven years. It's a long time, I know. <laughs> Amen, Tarn, thank you. You don't have to clap, that's fine. <laughs> um, but I've done youth ministry for seven years in various aspects and various outlets and stuff, but things have changed. The way I do things have changed. The way I preach has changed, right? I now do three-point messages. I know, I'm a grown-up now, okay? <laughs> I know. Before, non-denominational church, I would just get up and yell for 30 minutes, right? That's just what I would do, right? I've toned down the yelling a little bit. But, but, but things change, people change, and that's an okay thing, that's a good thing. But listen, we need to be asking ourselves, are we changing with the people? Are we, are we figuring out new ways to reach them? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33 says this, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but for the good of many, so that they may be saved. Paul is everything to everyone because he wants to get anyone saved. That is why he does what he does. Listen, 1 Corinthians 9.22, we're going to go back a little bit. To the weak I became weak. This is not up there. Sorry, Taylor. Or sorry, Kathy, my bad. Uh, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means... I might save some. Paul just goes before this, talking about his qualifications for being an apostle, right? We know Paul's qualifications for being an apostle. He's like, listen, here we go. I have all authority to be like the, the head honcho of the church right now. Like, that's, I can do that. I'm the guy, right? I'm Paul. I've written most of the New Testament, right? Like, I'm, I'm Paul. I'm a big deal. Well, listen, there's a reason the Holy Spirit's held on to the Scripture for so many years is because it's important for us to realize that he became all things to all people. To the weak, I became weak so that I might save some. Listen, I understand the question is, is why change, right? Why do these things? Listen, any tradition that we hold on to, anything that we do is someone else's innovation. Let me explain. The printing press, right? When the printing press was, was first invented, you know the first thing that was printed on it? The Bible. Absolutely. The Bible was created. Or not created, sorry. Wrong word. The Bible was printed. The church at the time lost their minds. Because see, this word of God that we all hold in our hands, that we have in our phones, we have available all the time, like the scriptures we have on our walls, out of context at our house, right? We have all these things that we have, right? And some of you guys are like, hey, hey, easy there. Pump the brakes there. Hobby Lobby will never lie to me, right? But listen, <laughs> listen. The things that we have are because, that, because someone innovated and said, listen, we can now mass produce the word of God and give it to every person coming to church so they can know the power of Jesus. Because before the church, listen, the only people that would be allowed to preach are the priests standing in their robes, lectern style, that was it. That was the only people that deserved the word. And that's why the church lost their minds. Like, this is not common knowledge. This should not be known by the people. Listen, if I did not have this word of God in my life, if I was not able to read this, let me tell you what, I would not be in the position I'm in right now. I would not be in the position I'm in right now. Because no matter how many times I've heard a message, how many times I've heard worship, my own personal devotion to God is what really has caught me. It was really gotten me into the word, knowing more about the character of Jesus, studying this book and underlining things, going, who is God? Who does he say he is? Listen, worship. Worship of the early church used to be only voices, right? It was only vocals because every instrument was of the devil, right? And if you're Pentecostal, you believe that until 1979, right? Uh, every instrument's of the devil, <laughs> I have Pentecostal roots, guys. It's okay. <laughs> but in reality, we know that worship has changed, right? They used to take old bar songs and mix them together because they wanted to make music that was more relevant to the time. That's where you got your hymnals from. 
yeah, I know, hymnals, bar songs, it didn't make sense, right? But they did, right? Kathy and I were just talking about this before service, and she said, I, I can't remember his name, I'm sorry, Kathy. Isaac Watts, right? Created hymns because he came to his dad, who was a pastor, and said, I don't like the music we play. And his dad said, make better music then. He said, okay. It was in the 1500s, right? We've changed the way we do worship. And every time we seem to change the way we do worship, the church loses its mind. 1960, this scrawny dude comes out. Uh, his name is Billy Graham. You probably never heard of him, right? And Billy Graham comes out and he says, hey, I want praise and worship music to be played at my, my crusades that we're doing. And the church accused him of emotionalism. You're only doing this to attack people's emotions. And listen, he's going, no, no, no. I'm, a, I'm trying to get people to Jesus by all means possible. There's people that like music that may not like to hear the message as much, but that music is going to really hit them in the heartstrings, and that's what's going to get them saved. That might be the case for some, and I'm going to be like Paul, and I'm going to do all things for all people so that some might be saved. In 1988, a little church by the name of Hillsong started by Brian Houston. I do a really good Brian Houston. If you know who he is, we can talk later. Anyway, but Brian Houston started this church, right? And they began making music in a dark room with lights and lasers and smoke, and it was like a concert, right? It was very entertaining, and that was the way it grabbed people. And, and the people at the church like, whoa, 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 this isn't a concert. Oh, hold on. We need to crank out the hymnals here. This is not how church should be. But let me tell you what. This is one of the biggest churches on the face of the planet right now. A large part of that was because of their worship. They said, listen, yeah, it's entertaining. But entertainment is okay. I know this is a hard thing, right? This is another podcast I heard, right? The pastor was talking about how entertainment is okay. What's not okay is amusement. We're not here to amuse you. Amuse, right? The word breaks down to A meaning not, and muse thinking, right? So amusement means not thinking. So you go to an amusement park so you can forget about all the debt you're in for going to the amusement park, right? Like you go there, you're like, all right, cool, right? Like that's why you go. You're just like, we're just gonna have a good time. We're gonna forget about all the costs, right? Let's just swipe the card again, right? Gets declined, here's a different card, right? Whatever it may be, right? And so we, we look at this and as a church, yeah, I wanna entertain you guys. That's why I yell, that's why I squat, that's why I do high kicks sometimes, whatever it may be, because I want you guys to be engaged. I want you guys to go, okay, that's not only hitting me in the heart, that's hitting me in the brains. It's just a different way of doing things. Any tradition we hold on to is someone else's innovation. We all have different styles, especially when it comes to worship on Sunday. Some of us like hymns. Amen. Right? We have a hymn sing. Right? Amen. I like hymns. That's what I was raised on. Right? Right? Some of you guys are like, yes! Hymns! Right? That's okay. That's good. I'm really excited. Uh, but some of us, like if you guys were talking to Greg Golding, he loves rap. I love rap too. I don't like Christian rap. I got to be honest with you guys. I got to come clean a little bit. But he, he has the 116 click tattooed on his, on his arm. Right, that's a, that's a group of Christian artists creating music, specifically in the style of rap and in spoken word, where they are trying to reach people with their specific medium of art. That's what they're doing. Some people like screamo. I know people who love, like, worship screamo music. I don't understand it, but there are people that like it. And that's like, that's their, that's their thing, right? Some of us like a contemporary, some of us like acoustic, and none of these ways are the right way or the wrong way of doing things. Biblically speaking, there's no verse that says, thou shalt only have concert-style worship. I wish there was. I wish there was. I wish there was. Okay, that's me. All right? I wish there was a verse that said this. So I can be like, look, guys, it's in First Opinions, chapter 2, right? Um, and we could be like, here we go, right? Um, but it's not. But it's not. We need to be asking ourselves, how are we engaging people in worship? Not just our church congregants. But also, if anyone wants to walk through that door, are they going to walk in and go, this is music I can get behind? Yeah, this, this feels right. Right, this, this feels like the music I'm listening to on the radio. This feels like something that I want to be a part of. This is good, talented music. Listen, Pastor Taylor is doing a phenomenal job. I love that man so much. Amen. Amen. Clap it up for him. Listen, Pastor Taylor has such a heart of worship that it's incredible. If you don't know the man's heart, you need to take him out to coffee in the next couple of weeks. You buy him coffee, okay? I got you, man. He bought me coffee this morning. So, yeah, you guys buy him coffee, all right? Listen, and take him out and just ask him, what's your heart of worship? And he's going to tell you his vision and his heart for worship because he has such an incredible heart for loving people and loving God. And really, he's a multi-tool. He can literally do anything. He could take, he could easily take my job, guys. Let's be honest. Like, I mean, the guy is freaking equipped. Anyways, uh, like, but talk to him. His heart of worship. Now, listen. Let me be specific here. He's not a DJ. Don't go up to him and be like, hey, man, 
I want to hear your heart of worship. Hey, speaking of heart of worship, can you play that song next week, right? Like, listen, he's not a DJ. Don't go for requests. But what you should do is go, hey, listen, I want to hear your heart for Selma and for this ministry. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. He had no idea I was going to talk to him, talk about him. But, hey, love you, man. Um, everything we do as a church needs to reflect our heart, our vision, and our mission that God has put on us. To love God, love others, and leave a legacy, right? Serve God, serve others. Serve like, oh, man, I messed it up. Jack's going to be really mad at me. Pastor Jack, sorry. 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 Um, but why do we innovate? God stays the same, right? Right? God stays the same yesterday as he is today, as he is forever. The reason we innovate, the reason we change things is because people change. Culture changes. Society changes. Listen, what worked 50 years ago may not work now, and that's why it's important for us to keep an open mind and an open hand. There's this formula that Pastor Jonathan from Harris Creek says. He says, uh, limited means plus much passion, plus methods held loosely equals maximum innovation. Let's say that again. Limited means. Okay, let's look at that. What does that mean? That means limited money, right? Finances are li our limited means, right? Our time, our talent, and our treasures, those can be limited at times, right? If you're working three jobs, your time is pretty limited. Maybe you have a lot of talent, but you have a lot of other obligations, and so maybe it's limited. But listen, limited means, I look out here, and I see this church. And I believe we have an abundance of means. I believe we have people in here. And I'm not just talking about finances. I need you guys to understand that. Yeah, there's some people in here who have some deep pockets. Amen, hallelujah, praise God for you. But I believe we have a lot of people in here with some talent. Talent that they're not necessarily tapping into. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? Some of you guys got that talent. Maybe your talent is loving on people so ferociously that they don't even know what to do, right? Like Sally came up to me today and almost had me in tears because she's just like, I love you. God is going to use you today. You're going to, I'm like... Oh, thank you so much. I needed this. You know what I mean? Like, I'm praying for you. I don't know if she's praying that I end earlier or what it is, but she's praying for me. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Maybe your talent is just loving people ferociously. Maybe your talent is construction. Whatever it may be, we have an abundance of means here at this church. I believe that. Now, the second part of the formula, right? Plus much passion. Listen, if you don't got enough passion, I got enough for both of us. Okay, I'll give, some, I'll give you some of my passion, right? But like, I believe we have some passionate people in here. I, be, I know we have some passionate people in here. So we have those, okay, check, limited means plus much passion plus methods held loosely. This is where I stumble, where I go, well, this is the way I do it because it's the way I like to do it. But listen, is it the most effective way, right? Is it the most effective way? And if it is, sweet, awesome. Let's try to improve on that. If it's not, we're holding it loosely so we can decide to innovate and change it up. And that's where we're going to get the maximum amount of innovation. Uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle of Life Church, they created this little app. You probably all have it on your phones if you have a smartphone. Uh, it's called the YouVersion app, where you can literally have your Bible on your phone. That took them going, who do we have? We have some techie guys. Okay, cool. What's the vision? What's the need that we see? We have a need for a Bible on your phone so that everyone can have the Word of God on their phone. Okay, cool. Let's make an app. And they did. And now everyone in the, in the United States, at least, like pretty much can have that app on their phone, right? The world can have the app on their phone. That's an incredible innovation, right? What are some needs that we as a church see in our communities around us? Some of you guys are in life groups. You guys should just, I, I believe that's one of the questions I have in the, in the life group teaching this week. And I encourage you guys to talk about the life group teaching this week because it's important. Hey, what are the needs we see in our community, and how can we as a life group, we as a church, meet those needs? Ask that question. We need to ask ourselves, how can we be most effective? Um, listen, one thing, one of the biggest reasons why we need to be able to be innovative is because this couple rows right here, we're light today. A lot of our core team kids are gone. The worst kids. I'm just kidding. I love them. Um, but they're Gen Z. They're not millennials. I know anyone under 35 to some of us is a millennial. No, I'm the last of the millennials, like the last of the Mohicans. That's me, okay? Um, but anyone younger than me at this point is, is a Gen Z, and then below that is, uh, I think it's alpha generation. But Gen Z is, this is important, church. They are the first post-Christian generation. What that means is that a lot of these guys, when they go off to college or even now, a lot of their friends are going to be non-churched or they're going to be de-churched or they're going to be like dead-churched. They're not going to know the power of the name of Jesus as we just sung about a few minutes ago. Okay, that's, that's kind of a depressing fact, right? Like, I think we can agree. We're like, oh, man, how far we've fallen, right, as a nation, right? Or as a, as a world, how far we've fallen. But listen up. With this new fact here of us being post-Christian generation, that means we as a church have an opportunity. And I don't know about you guys, but that opportunity 
fills me with excitement and glee because that means that we as a church have a bigger obligation and a bigger opportunity to reach people for Jesus doing anything short of sin. That's your next thing here, anything short of sin to get people to the feet of Jesus. It's a young life saying that we say, right? Doing anything short of sin to get people to the feet of Jesus because that is what it is about. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about him and getting people to his feet. And innovation and change are a big part of that. Look at, the, look at your cell phones. Everyone has their cell phone, right? Some of you guys have iPhones. Some of you guys have Androids. Some of you guys, you know, the real ones have flip phones still. God bless you. Um, but imagine, take yourself back with 2004, 2005, right? You can imagine Steve Jobs walks into his board meeting, right? His board of directors meeting. He walks in and he says, okay. He pulls out one pocket. He has his iPod, iPod video. You guys are like, what's an iPod video? I know, it's retro. Okay. Pulls out an iPod video. And in this hand, he pulls out his Motorola Razor, right? It's like super cool, coolest phone at the time, right? You open it up, it's like super thin. It's like you, super thin, Isaiah, right? <laughs> Turns to the side, it's like, where'd the phone go, right? Uh, <laughs> love you, man. Anyways, but he looks at these two things and he goes, okay, this works well, this works well. Okay, cool. What if they were the same thing? And he pitches it, tells all his board members, hey, guys, put your phone and your iPod on the table. They all put it on there, right? Those like REM or whatever, right? They put them down there and they're like, okay. Put them on top of each other. That's weird, okay? What if they were the same thing? I call it the iPhone. What if they laughed him out of that room? They said, that's the worst idea we've ever heard, Steve. You know, go back to making colorful computers, right? Like, that's an absolutely terrible idea. Could you imagine the landscape of the world we'd live in right now? It'd look completely different. And some would argue for the better. Some would argue for the worse. But now we live in the most connected society that there has ever been, Right? Because of an invention called the iPhone. Now, some can argue Samsung was working on it, but Samsung's trash, so it doesn't matter. Um, some of you guys are really offended about the Samsung thing. All right, whatever. Uh, but look at our lives, right? If you guys go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, hey, um, listen, you've gotten really sick. Um, you, have, you, you have whatever disease it is, right? It could be whatever you want to fill in your head. You need to change the way you eat. You need to change the way you, your lifestyle. Are you going to change the way you do things? Probably, right? Doctor tells you, hey, you have diabetes. You need to change what you eat. You need to stay away from sugar. You need to do these things. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do those things as much as I can, right? Or maybe you're like, or maybe it's, uh, it's hey, listen, you have, uh, you have celiac disease. You need to stay away from wheat and gluten. You're going to stay away from wheat and gluten in order to stay alive a little bit longer and to be a little more comfortable, right? Right, that makes sense. You're going to innovate a little bit on what you're doing. You're going to make different meals. Maybe you have less pizza, right? For some of you guys, less beer, right? I mean, let's be honest, right? We're going to have less of these things because we need to innovate. We need to change things up. And that's a good thing. Why shouldn't the church be any different? Looking at it going, there's a problem outside our doors, all around. There's a problem of, there's a problem of homelessness. There's a problem of, of people in low-income communities not feeling loved and, and cherished and not, not being appreciated. I have a girl in one of my classes who, who, whose dad got deported when she was 16 years old, and her, being, her mom was disabled, and so she had to go to work at 16, had to drop out of school and work. Now she got her GED, and now she's, she's going to school. And like, honestly, I, I, she was telling me the story, and I was like, I was like are you serious? Like, that's insane. But yeah, I, I've decided to pick myself up by my bootstraps. But a lot of my friends who've gone through similar situations haven't. They've fallen into addiction. They've fallen into uh, just being with, you know, being part of gangs. They've fallen into these type of things because that's the way they found their family. That's the way they found hope and value. Listen, church, we should be the beacon of hope and value in our community. That's what we need to be. That's what we need to be. We need to be a hospital. And I understand that it can be hard. It can be, be scary. Some of us are like, whoa, bro, you said change. You cannot say that on stage. We need to pump the brakes here, right? I'm going to get like a shepherd's hook to take me off the stage. But I think it's important. But I want to I iterate this. I want you guys to understand that we can change, we can innovate without losing our core values, right? What are some things we cannot change? We cannot change what the Bible tells us to do, okay? We cannot change that. There are things we might want to change, like, I don't really like that, God, but we cannot change what the Bible tells us, okay? So that's, that's check one. Okay, cool. Uh, when we were in, Kelsey, myself, uh, when we were engaged, we went with our, my in-laws, uh, Gary and Terry, went to Disneyland, right? And I love Disneyland. If you know me, I love Disneyland. We all love Disneyland. It's like the best place in the world, right? Happiest place on earth. Absolutely true. Um, and so we, we would go to Disneyland. It's the 60th anniversary. And so they had the World of Color show and it's like on all the lights and stuff like that and pyrotechnics and smoke and projections. It's super cool. And, and it was a special 60th anniversary World of Color show. 
Neil Patrick Harris was doing the voiceover of it, and, and at one point he said something at the end, and I, I don't remember hearing it. I, I remember hearing it, but I don't like remember what it was. Kelsey's actually the one that caught on to it. I think I didn't remember because I was crying, because Disney, I love Disney, right guys? I'm an emotional person. Uh, and so Kelsey, as we're walking, back, we're walking back to where we were staying, she goes, Cody, did you hear what he said at the end there? Like, what did he say? He goes, the reason Disney is so successful is because they never lost sight of their creator. Neil Patrick Harris was spitting some biblical truth, right? He was speaking some biblical truth without him knowing it, right? Because that applies to us. The reason the church is, this is what I want to hear. In 60 years from now, I want them to say the reason Selma First is so successful is because they never lost sight of Jesus. They never lost sight of their creator, God, and they realized that, that things change, that traditions change, right? Because if you look, one of Walt's biggest things was his imagineering, right? I mean, the guy was kind of a terrible dude, but like some of the stuff he did was awesome, right? And listen, he said ideas like Frozen. I can't remember how many times, how, many, uh, how long Frozen was in the vault, but someone pitched him the idea. He says, that's a great idea, not yet. It's a great idea, not yet. You hold on to that. We'll, we'll pop that out in a few more minutes, right? Or a few more minutes, in a few more, a few more years, we'll pop that out. And now it's one of the most successful animated movies of all time, right? Sarah's singing, let it go. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> We need to be willing to change things and make the people around us, we need to love them with everything we've got. Do anything short of sin. We need to be okay with change. We need to be okay with being obedient. As, as, as I'm finishing up here, I want Pastor Taylor and the band to come up here uh, as, as I'm finishing. But listen, uh, when I was at Hume Lake this, this past winter, a winter camp, I was, I'm going to be honest, can I be transparent with you guys right now? I struggle with depression. And so going to Hume, I was, I was depressed. I was not feeling it. I was not having it, right? We get to camp, and the entire way, like, Allie and Isaiah knew I did not want to be there. Both Isaiah's, sorry, Isaiah to the second power. They know, <laughs> it was for you, Russ. Um, anywho, they knew, they knew I didn't want to be there. I was like, I'm not feeling it. I don't want to be here right now. I just, I have school starting up next week. I'm stressed. There's a lot of stuff going on. I'm just not ready for this right now. We get into worship uh, the first night, and, and I sit there during the second song, and, and I just remember the words that Peter told me, obedience is not a feeling. I know that worship is my obedience, and so I said, God, it's yours. God, I give it all to you. Lord, it's all yours. I began to open my hands and begin worshiping. And I'm going to be honest, guys, the water work started. I just began to bawl, got the ugly chin and everything, because God was working through me. He was saying, Cody, it's not about you. It's about me. You need to be obedient. You're here for a reason. The next morning, I had another chapel. I was like throwing up that morning. I don't know, too much information. I was really sick. Huh.